Professor Frank, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. And I'm just so thrilled to see so many um, friends and colleagues here. And um, I thank you all for giving up your time this evening uh, to be here. And I know that some of you have really travelled quite some distance. Uh, and I'm, I'm truly grateful. So um, the lecture is um, called, unsurprisingly, Communicating COVID-19. And um, it's a mixture of um, science and some personal thoughts, too. Um, when I was first told of the David Attenborough Award, um, my first reaction was surprise, followed by a, a deep sense of unworthiness. Um, and then it finally sunk in that, you know, what a great honour it was to uh, receive uh, this evening's oration. Um, the unworthiness really stems from being, uh, until 2017, just a common or garden university professor who happened to have a 30-year experience in respiratory virus, uh, viruses, prevention and control, but in other ways was still you know, very ordinary and essentially unknown outside of my own academic field, um, uh, with a very ordinary educational background from a very ordinary market town in Lincolnshire. And um, one of the potential titles of a book that I'm, I might write at some point is leading by accident, because that's exactly what it feels like. Um, and if accident isn't quite the right word, then um, unintentional definitely is. Um, I expected my um, stint as DCMO, which began in 2017, to be kind of stimulating, challenging, important, something new on a career pathway. But I don't think um, anyone could have predicted how it became life-defining and, and life-changing, as it, it has done. Um, and another title for the book, I suppose, is Communicating by Accident. Um, and yes, there were arduous media tests involved in getting the DCMO role. But I think I just found myself in a certain place at a certain time in history. Um, and when you find that, you've just got to get on with it. Um, sometimes in life, you can't avoid difficult situations. The only way you can get out of them is to go through them. And um, as someone who is not trained in communication or communication theory, I do feel like an imposter um, standing here. And people, people have said to me, where did you develop your ability to communicate? And the answer is, I really don't know. Um, uh, it, it's just comes from somewhere. Now, in the lecture this evening, I'm going to start with some personal reflections on learning to communicate. I'm then going to talk about some general and specific observations about communication challenges in pandemics, and then the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in particular. And I'm not going to narrate the full story of our pandemic, but I'm going to touch on some of the specific phases and challenges, and then kind of leave you with some kind of um, personal approaches. So if I may begin with some personal reflections, um, I'm going to start with this slide. This is my dad. Um, my, my, my dad passed on in 2015, but he had a really remarkable and very varied life. He grew up in rural poverty in, in the Mekong Delta, in, in, uh, in, the, in what was then the Republic of Vietnam. Um, he transitioned from there and adjusted to life um, as the son of a former prime minister of the Republic of Vietnam, to life in Paris in the 1950s, um, with a very changed lifestyle, changed culture. And then he readapted again to um, coming to Lincolnshire and the, uh, th for love, for, for marrying my mother, and then um, the ordinariness of just becoming a, um, a junior um, secondary school teacher. Um, of mathematics, and he gave one of his uh, probably only interviews to the local paper, and one of the things he said was that, as I teach the kids, they teach me. And there was something very kind of profound in that for me, um, about, first of all, his ability to adapt his personal style to the um, environment he was in, um, but also the fact that education, um, so, so communication is, is as much about listening to other people and kind of getting that feedback from them as it is about speaking yourself. Um, let's fast forward then to my first day in medical school. There I was again as a kind of imposter, um, surrounded by students with top, top A-level grades. And um, at the time, the, the standard threshold for entry into medicine was three Bs at A-level in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and so it did feel a bit strange with my D in chemistry and my E in mathematics um, standing alongside these, the, these kids. And of course, it was before the days of widening participation, so welcome it now, in 
in our universities. And quite strange for a, you know, a kid with bad grades from a state grammar school with a broadish Lincolnshire accent um, to, uh, to, to, to be at this modern medical school in Nottingham. But I'll never forget the dean's opening words, Rex Coupland. He said, if you've got a local accent, don't lose it. Let keep it, because one day it's going to be really important for the patients that you treat. And the next day he sent us down the coal mine, because at the time, <laughs> no, quite seriously, because at the time um, coal, coal mining was still prominent in Nottinghamshire, and the purpose of that was to do a shift with the coal miners and completely understand um, them, how they spoke, how they had to live and work, and what their lived experience of kind of um, work and health actually meant. And that stuck with me. Um, that really stuck with me forever. And it was the first time, I think, that um, <clears throat> the notion that a physician might be measured partly in terms of success by their ability to communicate to their patients, that, that really, really came to me. And um, it was the first time that authenticity crept into my conversations with myself about how to practice medicine. Um, and so, you know, it kind of dawned on me that if you um, want to talk to a minor and treat a minor, you need to know how a minor thinks and how a minor lives their lives. And at, from that moment on, I realised it was okay um, to... Um, let some of yourself into conversations with patients. And that's why this quote on this slide is really important to me, that it isn't actually about what you know, it's about what you feel about what you know in terms of how you deliver it. And that, that again, has, has stuck with me all, all through, through my working life. Um, fast forward now to um, 1988, I'm qualified, and I'm kind of a bit... A bit daunted to tell this story in front of a professor of orthopaedic trauma, but I'll give it a go. Um, uh, a minor hobbled into the emergency room um, in, in the Queen's Medical Centre, and on the, on the casualty sheet it just said, um, uh, injury, injury right leg. And, and so I said, well, what happened to you? And he said, oh, I dropped a rock on, on my leg at work today. And it was clear that it was an open wound, and I said, and it would look, look bad. And so we got an X-ray, and then um, the X-rays came back, and I said, well, look, this is a, this is a compound fracture. And um, the miner said, oh, oh, thanks, thanks for that. I can go home then, can I now? And I said, no, 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 it's, 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 it's a compound fracture. It's fractured. And clearly there was n something that wasn't right between us, and I thought about it a bit more, and I said, look, mate, you bust your leg. And at that point he said, oh, right, thanks, Doc. Now I understand. And, and he, he got back on the couch. He didn't want to go home anymore. Um, <laughs> And then as, as this kind of parting shot before he went up to theatres, um, I said, how big was this rock? Thinking it would be kind of like the big ones you buy at garden centres. He said, oh, it was about three quarters of a tonne, mate. <laughs> and I realised that actually the way I'd framed his injury was my framing, not, not his framing. Uh, and that was really an important and kind of sobering lesson. So to communicate with ordinary people, you... I'm putting it to you that you need a connection. Now, my particular kind of loves and connections are to the UK Armed Forces um, and to um, the uh, men and women who support um, uh, lower league football every Saturday. Uh, this is uh, Boston United on the right and uh, some of my colleagues from 306 Hospital Support Regiment on the left. And um, you don't have to have um, a love of the military or a love of uh, lower league football but I put it to you that um, getting into an environment where you meet and, and, and interact with a broad spectrum of people with very different lived experiences to your own, very different backgrounds to your own, and possibly much, much less time to even think about health and medicine is actually important. So um, good communicators tend to have a very wide range of people they interact with. And to those of you who are younger in the room and aspire uh, in, in the kind of communication side, uh, go out there and just find your connections. They don't have to be my connections, but you do need to find some connections and practice working on communicating with different people in different places and in different walks of life. So now we're getting a bit more serious now. We're going to talk about um, communication theory. Now, 
Um, I did say to you at the beginning, I'm not a communication expert, and that's absolutely true. But I do remember about two hours of teaching as a public health registrar on communication theory. And this isn't quite the diagram that the lecturer put up, but it's pretty similar. And it, it basically has the notion that, you know, there's somebody who sends um, the, the message, there's somebody who receives it, the message is the bit in the middle, it might have some noise contained within it, um, and obviously it's got to have a channel, there's got to be a kind of a vehicle by which the message moves from the sender to the receiver, and hopefully there's a bit of feedback as well, but not always. And, um, you know, if it's a very kind of linear model of, of communication, basically you say it and you hope they heard it. Um, if it's interactional, um, then uh, you, you get more of a kind of two-way process. And if it's transactional, it's even possible that together you create the message um, and, and kind of refine and, and hone the message so that uh, the end user says, this is, this is, I understand this now. And if you dissect it a little bit further, actually it's a bit more complicated than that. There's a source, there's a sender, and they might not be the same. There's a channel, there's a receiver. There's a destination which may not be the same as the receiver. There's a message and, and, and components of the message of the size and the purpose. And then there's some feedback. And I'll come back to that later, but that's my little kind of lesson on the, um, the theory of communicating for you. Um, I'm going to now make some um, remarks about pandemics generally um, and why I think they offer great challenges in terms of communication. So... Um, four things stand out for me. The first is that um, pandemics are rare and they're not in the public consciousness most of the time until they actually happen. And um, sometimes they're severe, as in 1918 to 19, as in 2020 to 2023, but sometimes they are very mild, as in the swine flu pandemic of 2009. And that, again, adds another difficulty, that they're not always bad. People not only um, forget that they exist in between pandemics, but they're not always bad when they, they occur. And the problem's actually deeper than that, in that many organisations, and I'm going to say it, and governments, um, don't always truly remember the last one. And... Um, Corporate memory and instilled organisational memory and learning may be quite poor between pandemics. And there's a personnel issue too. Relatively few people who served in the present pandemic also served in the last. So I've actually done my homework on this one. And I, I, I look back to the SAGE membership in 2009 during the swine flu pandemic. There were three of us. Um, who served on SAGE in 2020, who also, uh, who also served on SAGE in 2009. That's not very many people. And it's just not a criticism, it's just a, a function of the passage of time and the changing in people's careers. But it is what it is. Um, and not all pandemics are widely recognised by the public as pandemics. Um, Certainly respiratory pandemics are well recognised, but the HIV AIDS um, pandemic, and it definitely was a pandemic, is not framed by everybody as a pandemic, though it absolutely was. But um, as you'll have been following the news and uh, understanding the, uh, the nature of the inquiry and, and, and uh, module one, um, uh, you know, what pandemics we've had in the past is relevant. And it is just a fact of contemporary global history that um, respiratory pandemics have um, very largely been due to influenza. Um, there, were, there have been five respiratory pandemics in the last 105 years, and four of them have been due to a novel influenza virus. And I'm going to leave that little bit there. Now, I'm going to turn now to things that are a bit more SARS-CoV-2 specific in terms of the communication challenges. And um, uh, these are my own views, of course, but um, the first uh, couple of things I want to talk about are um, the global resurgence of populism in terms of the political environment, which I think could reasonably be argued but began again in 2018. And I think that changed the environment, in uh, the kind of communication environment in a very general sense, um, and certainly um, changed the kind of geopolitical backdrop um, to what happened um, during the, the pandemic. 
And um, you know, students of business, and, and I'm a very, very, still a very, very bad one, but still a student at the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, desperately trying to get a qualification in uh, leadership and management. I've been trying since 2016, um, but work keeps getting in the way. But I think I'm, I might have cracked it this time. Um, but I'm a very bad student there. But we, we've talked and, and studied globalisation and when it actually began. And you know, there are there are people in the room who say, well, it, look, it began with the Silk Road and that the, the spy routes and others say no it was the industrial revolution that's really when the um, uh, globalization began began and we can argue about when it began but I think we can all agree that in the last decade um, our economies have been become hyper globalized and that has really changed the environment in which we've had to operate um, during this pandemic and then a bit closer to home um, this is the first pandemic um, that has been conducted in the spotlight of really intense social media, multiple channels, uh, some good, some bad, some uh, uh, factual, some very non-factual. It is also the first pandemic in human history which has been severe and where we've also had vaccines and antiviral drugs to um, offer um, against the, uh, the, the threatening pathogen. But it's the first time those, those three things have occurred um, in combination in a relatively short period of time. And it's the first time that most countries, but not all, um, have used population-level non-pharmaceutical interventions since 1918. And that, again, was a very kind of new challenge. Uh, so I'm going to come back now um, to those key elements in communication theory and talk a little bit more um, about them. First of all, in terms of the source, um, one has to actually dissect communication out a bit and say, what is the source? Is it the government? Is it the public health agency? Is it a, uh, a professional? Or is it a non-expert? And secondly, um, then who is the sender? Because the sender may not be quite the same as the source. The sender might be a politician, um, it might be an expert, it might be a healthcare worker, it could be a layperson, and it could be from a domestic or an international source. But the sender is a little bit different sometimes from the source. And then the channel may be official or unofficial, it may be traditional or non-traditional, with all the different forms of social media that have now arisen and are established. The receiver is um, the person who listens for the message and takes the message in, but may not be quite the same as the destination, which is saying who are the ultimate recipients of um, the message. And that may not be the person who, who, who receives it. In the same way that, um, you know, in, in, in the military, a message may well come through um, to, uh, to, to a, a radio operator who then passes it on to a section commander. So it may well not be the same person who's a listener uh, for whom the, the message is destined to be, to be heard and understood by. And then there's something about the message itself and the purpose of the message. Um, what size is it? What size should it be? What information should it contain? Is it an instruction or is it both? Is it information and instruction? And then there's this element of feedback. Who, how and whether the feedback was received and acted upon. And I don't want to make it say to you anything more than that actually it's a very complicated space. And the more you think about it, the more you realise that communication is quite a complicated space. But if it, you get it right, um, then success um, kind of ends with um, the destination, the people at the destination saying this is a message that carries integrity, um, that I can identify with, and that I am prepared to respond to. And that those are the key things that you want at the end of the day. So I'm changing gear now. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the specific challenges um, of communicating during the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic at different phases. Now, this is not going to be um, a catalogue of um, you know, what we've been through and who said what when 
that's for the inquiry. I'm simply going to pick out just a few exemplars of things where I, at times and moments, where I felt the communication was challenging and um, it was important that we got it right. So um, some of you will have seen this slide before. It is a snapshot of about a month in October 2020 from Nottinghamshire. Um, it is typical UK epidemiology of the um, ascending wave of, um, uh, 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 of infection during, during the pandemic. And each vertical slice is a day from um, late September until um, late October. And each horizontal slice is an age band from 0 to 15s at the bottom through 16 to 29s, 30 to 44, 45, 59, and then 60 plus. And um, what you can see is um, that this infection burns brightest, earliest in the 16 to 29-year-olds. And the biomathematical modelers absolutely know that because they know all the contact, uh, the, the contact data and, and they completely understand that at that age, and you do too, you, you understand that at that age you have a lot of social contacts uh, compared as you, as you kind of get older. And if you still own um, uh, teenagers, um, you will know that they don't talk to their um, younger siblings very much. And you can see that in the data, that the, uh, the youngest age band is, is, doesn't, really, doesn't really heat up. But you can see that they do talk to a big sister or big brother who's you know, just left home and comes back a bit, the 30 to 44s. And they then talk a bit more to their parents. And they then talk to their, um, to their parents, to the grandparents. And you can see, literally, over the space of just a couple of weeks, this rapidly heating up problem that gets more and more penetrative into the elderly population as time goes by. And that, of course, is where um, and how we always get the problem. And that was really the context of um, communication in the first half of 2020 of our pandemic, um, that we were faced with very rapid spread. We were faced with a, a, a very high mortality burden concentrated in the over 50s, um, a high hospitalisation burden, mainly in the over 50s, but not exclusively so. And compared with something like seasonal flu, um, high clinical severity over about the age of 30. And crucially, no vaccines, no therapeutics, no drugs, and no, there could be no honesty at that point in promising that we could even get them. It wasn't just a case of when, it was also a case of if. And, and that was the reality of that kind of communication context. And so I felt that what was needed was, um, first of all, just a straight admission that we, at this point we don't know everything. This is a new virus. The virus is changing. We are changing as we learn more. And um, we, we just don't know yet. Um, a communication that all of this is difficult. There are no easy choices um, and no choices without some kind of counter cost behind them. There is also significant uncertainty and probably a very long road ahead Whatever an optimistic politician might have said in terms of a few weeks or a few months, actually, I think, in the public health space, we understood this would be a long road uh, that lasted several years. And that there were no magic bullets at this point. There were no get-out-of-jail-free cards that were going to appear. And that we were going to take incoming fire. We were going to take some damage. Uh, and, you know, everyone's very sorry about the... Uh, the damage that has occurred, but every society in the world has taken damage because of this new virus. But at the same time, you have to say, look, this is not the end of civilization. You have to try and get people to retain some calm assurance, and the key is to hold the nerve. The key is to say to your population, look, this is a team effort. This is a UK team effort. Right now, individual actions involving personal responsibility lead to combined epidemiological effects. And we just have to follow this route. There isn't really anywhere else we can go at the moment. And the non-pharmaceutical interventions were difficult for everybody. And they did have costs. And, and I'm not here to say they didn't, absolutely not. What I am here to say is that um, 
they were comp that the science behind the non-pharmaceutical interventions was actually quite complex. And there were probably three uh, domains that stand out for me. First is top left, the aerobiology of how um, COVID is actually transmitted from one person to another. Um, is it the big bits? Excuse the uh, revolting thought. But, <laughs> but, but is it the big bits that um, are like bullets that are ballistic and always drop to the ground? And what is their range? One to two metres. Um, or is it the fine particles that can stay suspended in the air for much longer and drift much further? But, of course, they dilute in a cubic um, decay manner because, um, because of the, the dimensions of, of, of how they're, um, they're, they're transmitted. So, that, so the aerobiology is really complicated, and getting people to understand what was involved was very difficult indeed. Um, the next bit was um, the period of communicability. And many members of the public, I think, thought that was the, the incubation period, and it's not. It's the time during which you are infected where you are also able to pass the infectious organism to other people. And that is really tricky for people to understand. And it's even more tricky when, you, when science eventually tells us that the time at which people are excreting most virus is either just before or on the cusp of the start of symptoms. And that's when I think people start to understand that this was really difficult to, to prevent in terms of transmission. But I love the simplicity of um, the Japanese three Cs. I thought this was really, really the best international example of helping people understand uh, why non-pharmaceutical interventions existed and the conditions under which COVID would transmit. Very simple, three Cs, closed spaces, brackets with poor ventilation, crowded places and settings where the intention or the purpose was close contact. And if you got those three together, then it was largely a dead cert for transmission. Behind the scenes, the hope for us all was that we would get vaccines. And the UK Vaccine Task Force was an absolutely astonishing endeavour that brought together the private sector, uh, the industrial scientific sector, the commercial people, the project management and some real government expertise with a ring fence budget and a very clear understanding that there was significant financial risk in everything that happened under that umbrella. And a portfolio approach to procurement, four different vaccine platforms um, uh, pursued uh, messenger RNA, where the science had been going on for, for two decades, adenovirus vector vaccines, where the UK government had made a major contribution to funding in 2016 that gave it really a, an enormous head start when the pandemic began, and some older technologies, the protein adjuvants and the inactivated whole viruses. But it was genuine partnership, and it was a genuine attempt to increase the UK ability to manufacture vaccines really fast. And you wanted to give people hope. It was very complex stuff, and, um, but you wanted them to understand it, it wasn't instant. And that's when I first started to use analogies uh, during the pandemic. I wanted things that people um, would find familiar, that they would find relatable, that they would find believable. Um, they were hopeful but they were also phased and eventual, and they gave us this sense of a collective experience. And, you know, there's something very collective about waiting for a train uh, and knowing that you can't get on it until it gets into the station and neither can anybody else. And there's something very collective about desperately, desperately wanting your side um, to get three points at quarter to five on, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and so th that's really... Um, how and why I started to use analogies as I did. Now, um, there is actually, believe it or not, um, some theory behind analogies. And I had to look this up to make, um, because I didn't know it, of course. Um, but, so the, but the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and including the contributions on the, the philosophy of science, um, has a chapter on analogy and analogical reasoning. Um, and um, 
it tells me reassuringly that the explicit use of analogical arguments um, has, has been going on since antiquity and is a distinctive feature of scientific, philosophical and legal reasoning. Um, if you delve further into that chapter, um, you can see that Aristotle actually put together some numerical theories of how um, uh, an analogies kind of work and interact. This was, this, this was one, one example, and it was a, about war between the, the Phocians, the Thebans, uh, and uh, the, 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 the analogy, I think, was um, war between the Athenians and the Thebans. But it was all very baffling when I read it, and I still don't understand it, and uh, um, I'm not pretending I do. But I just thought you'd like to see that there is some kind of um, formulaic approach to, to <laughs> analogical thinking. Um, there's also other stuff in, in, in the book, in the chapter, that says, look, you know, it's a bit more easy to understand. The more similarities, the stronger the analogy. The more differences, the weaker. Um, the greater our, the extent of our ignorance about the two domains, the weaker the analogy becomes, hence the football and the railways. Um, the weaker the conclusion, the more plausible the analogy. Don't lock it in too tight. Um, uh, causal relations and structural analogies are, tend to be stronger, and um, uh, multiple analogies supporting the same conclusion actually make the argument stronger. So there's just a little bit of a foray into analogical theory. Um, some of the other challenges we had were the fact that we, like every other country on Earth, didn't have enough vaccines at the very beginning of the pandemic. And we had to... Um, think about what to do about this and the JCVI and the chief medical officers together said we're going to extend the interval between the two doses. Uh, people are going to wait 12 weeks between one dose and the next one and if you look at kind of immunological theory and it's written down in the JCVI green book it's likely to work. It's likely that if you space the vaccine doses apart you're going to get a more potent immune response to the second one but it was highly controversial and um, there was a lot of vocal criticism from the BMA, from the World Health Organization initially, um, but ultimately um, that decision was supported by the data on infections. And the red dots really are just hazard ratios from the Siren Healthcare Worker Study um, of the uh, risk of infection. Um, and as you can see, they, they, the risk of infection gets lower as you move from left to right on the slide. And as you go on the x-axis, the interval between the two vaccines goes from 0 to 3 days through to 81 days on the right-hand side. So it is actually true that um, your protection against infection gets better if you can space the doses out further, further apart. But that's not an easy thing um, to communicate to the public. And, you know, it's just fallacy to think that when that happens um, the only thing in the room is science. Science doesn't exist in a vacuum and the surrounding issues around that um, decision and that, that tension at the time were the fact that we had a frightened elderly population um, you know, for whom vaccines meant the avoidance of death. Um, we had people who had already been waiting in isolation for 12 months praying for a vaccine every day. We had the vaccine manufacturer's instructions saying, give these vaccines 20, 28 days apart. That's all the instructions could say because that's all the clinical trials they did. Um, and the, there were people that believed that vaccination was going to instantly restore individual freedoms. And there was international competition and there was political rhetoric over vaccine supply and the international tension. So is it really surprising that people got very kind of worked up about this? The next big challenge was when the um, uh, uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia um, safety signal appeared for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. This was un unforeseen. It was difficult. Thankfully, we did have supply alternatives. And it did involve a very careful consideration of risk-benefit. But it was a decision that was really badly handled in terms of communication outside of this country, uh, particularly in Europe where I think it undermined confidence in a vaccine that was actually so cheap and so affordable that it was really accessible to um, low-income countries. And that was a shame. 
The Winton Centre very helpfully stepped in and gave us some lovely kind of graphical breakdowns and, uh, of the problem. And, and the, the orange dots are the serious harms due to the vaccine um, at different ages, and the blue dots are the uh, potential benefits in terms of uh, not having a trip to the intensive care unit. And you can see at the age of 60 to 69, it's an absolute no-brainer that the um, benefits totally outweigh the risks. And this continues, really, and it only starts to become slightly equivocal in the 30 to 39-year-olds and um, on, on, on the margin in the 20 to 29-year-olds. And that's why the UK decided that it would switch to messenger RNA vaccines in the under 40s. Um, but this was a really difficult moment for us uh, and one that I found very testing indeed. Um, I think the way to handle it was to just acknowledge it, that it was true. There was a safety signal. It was very rare. It couldn't have been discovered in the clinical trials. They weren't big enough, but it was there. Don't deny it. Don't trivialise it. Just give a careful description of the issue. Dissect it away carefully into small digestible chunks by age. Explain the logic. Use data to drive the arguments. And explain that why there are rational choices and alternatives at different um, ages of the population. So that was another really quite difficult moment. So time marches on, and um, I'm now moving into just a few um, final remarks on um, personal approaches. So the first one is um, uh, this, this slide, which is, uh, it, some people will read it as my CV on a page. Um, <laughs> others will read it as a, a sign of this is a man who gets bored very quickly and has to move on between organisations. But the real message here is, look, if you go, if you can in your careers, if you can go to different organisations, you get new experiences, you get new lenses on essentially the same world, and you en encounter different styles of communication um, for different audiences about the same subject. And if you can do that, and, and you can get these insights into other people's ecosystems, then um, you can get a better handle on how your message or your messaging might be perceived by others, and what the alternatives to the messaging are there too. But ultimately, um, I say, say what you actually mean, and then lead by example. I say answer the question as if it's your parents or your siblings who are asking you it. Give it back in honest and accessible language. And don't dodge the question. Failing to answer the question makes everybody dislike you. You may think you've been very, very clever because you didn't have to answer the question, but actually you've just made everybody dislike you. Um, so um, either answer it, or say you can't answer it. Um, and give an answer that is consistent with the wider facts, otherwise you start to look disingenuous. I've heard various people talking about NHS waiting lists recently. And um, one of the things you can't do is talk about um, you know, the kind of wonderful news that um, no one's waiting more than two and a half years any longer if the whole shape of the waiting population is actually getting larger. You kind of missed a point. There's something in the room, and you have to acknowledge it. Otherwise, you know, it starts to look difficult. And then be authentic. Let your true self into the room when you speak. Make a connection. Back to my point about making connections. Make a connection with your audience. If you make a connection with your audience, you've got them. They're there with you. They relate to you. And suddenly, the rest is a bit easier. Now, um, size matters more than you think. Um, less may be more. I'm not referring to the uh, fourth side of the Boston United Stadium. Um, <laughs> but I am um, referring to the fact that sometimes people in their lived experiences don't have time for all you want to say. They just want a quick bit. And um, I did a call during the pandemic with um, the Premier League captains. And um, uh, it was a team's call. And the uh, two boys are in the background going, oh, there he is, there he is, yeah. looking at all these uh, Premier League captains. And um, at the end of the call, one of the captains, and I'm not going to name them, so to, please don't ask me, said, um, Doc, could, could you do us a video? Because it'd be really useful to play to the lads in the, in the dressing room, the whole squad. And I said, yeah, I think I can probably do that for you. 
He said, but 30 seconds. He said, no more than 30 seconds because they won't concentrate for any longer. And, and, and I'm not being demeaning about footballers because I've got um, a, a child who's about to go into full-time football. But I'm saying that that's the experience, that's, that's the reality of what they want. They want 30 seconds. They don't want any more than that. Um, so you've got to kind of tailor your message to the audience. And I was at the University of Middlesex um, not very long ago, and over lunch, um, um, a, a lady who runs one of the big um, training centres, clinical training centres there, said, I'm always telling my students, talk English, not medicine or science. Now, I know we could stray into uh, the need for you know, 21 different languages and translation of important key materials in the UK, and that's fair too. But the point I'm making is... Um, we as scientists and we as medics, we talk a certain language, but you can't talk that with the public. You've got to talk, talk in, in native tongue. And it's okay um, not to be dour. It's okay to smile. These were very difficult times, um, but it was okay, in my view, just to let a little bit of yourself, just a chink of humour into the room, not inappropriately, not flippantly, but just to prove that, look, you know, any fool can be miserable. I was told that a long while ago in, 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 in the military, that, you know, when you're cold and wet, any fool can be miserable. You either be, you, you, no one's going to change the fact that you're cold and wet. So you can either start to enjoy it, or you can just feel sorry for yourself and be miserable. So which is it going to be? And so any fool can be miserable has come back and, and helped me so many times. And let yourself into the room if you can. And I realise that not everyone can let themselves into the room as much as maybe I can. Um, and then, finally and crucially, give people something they can make sense of in their own lives. Because if you can do that and they can walk away going, yeah, I get that, I'm going to do that tonight, I'm going to do that this week, I've got it, that's my job, that's my bit, then you've kind of, you've won the day. Now, um, again, I'm going to say, you know, how, how grateful I am to you all. Uh, for coming along and how grateful I am to the Royal Society for somehow picking me out for this lecture and, and this award. But in my view, um, you're looking now not at me but at the supreme champion of communication. Um, I think Jacinda Ardern was an absolute star uh, during the pandemic. And she's now been studied by people who are qualified to study these things, which is not me. Um, and um, they've picked out kind of five high-level themes of Jacinda Ardern's style of communication. And they are, first of all, that it's an evidence-based approach. Secondly, that she was decisive in how she communicated. She used education and information. She educated people and she gave them information. She was coordinated and aligned with everything else that was going on around her. And most importantly, and why I'm saying it last and why it's at the top of the slide, she showed real social solidarity with her people. And that is, for me, uh, the, you know, the absolute icing on the cake. So I am really now coming to the end of this lecture. I, I want to thank uh, my family and friends for immense and really immeasurable support over the last uh, few years. I want to pay tribute to the UK Armed Forces um, and thank them for many conversations over the last 40 years that have... Um, you know, taught me the good and the bad about how to communicate with people from all walks of life and have set the very best example for me in terms of demonstrating what it is to lead by example and what it is to serve to lead. And I want to thank um, my dear CMO um, family and DHSC extended family who are mainly over there. Um, it's a different kind of family, of course, um, but you are family, and um, you know we all knew what each of us were, were going through in that kind of technical and professional way that um, you know, real, you know families at home, um, blood families don't, um, and, and that was that was really important too. So thank you for that, and thank you for the to the people of the UK and uh, for the representatives of the people of the UK, the public who come along tonight for your um, feedback, your encouragement, your fortitude, and your deep understanding of uh, what we've been through. Thank you very much indeed.
thank you very much for that um, absolutely wonderful lecture. I'm glad I'm not a footballer. I could listen to you not for 30 seconds, but for 30 hours. I could have kept going uh, all evening, and as I'm sure many of you uh, could have done as well. However, things come to an end, and uh, sadly, the lectures come to an end, but we still have an opportunity to ask questions, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who has questions for JVT. So we have... Uh, uh, we, people there with microphones, uh, roving microphones, if you want to ask a question, uh, please put your hand up. But we also have questions for the, for, from the audience online. Uh, if you are listening online and you want to ask a question, there's a website called www.slido.com. Uh, and uh, once you're in that website, there is a code you need to enter. Uh, and the code is hash uh, DA. So let me repeat. So it's www.slido.com and the code is dash. Should be up there. It is up there. But maybe you cannot see it. But anyway, hash DA286. So let me just first see if there are any questions online. And um, oh gosh, I got this advanced piece of technology here. One, two, four, five, seven, eight. One, two, four, five, seven, eight. Right. Okay, so the uh, right now. So let me start with a question. Um, <laughs> there's some very good questions here. Anyway, so so the um, right. Let me start with this one. Um, uh, it's from somebody called David Goldsmith, uh, and the question is: um, with the benefit of the retrospective uh, scope. And hindsight, it's an advanced medical instrument, the retrospectoscope. And hindsight, uh, what should we have done better in the pandemic? And how should future teams managing pandemics have their communications better organized? Um, uh, how much, well, let's, let's take that. So what, uh, let's look into the future, not so much what we could have done better, because there's a whole inquiry on that. But um, what... Um, should future teams managing pandemics, how do they, how should they deal with their communication? Yeah, so I completely agree with you. The retrospectoscope is a marvellous medical and public health instrument <laughs> um, that uh, does teach us things after the event. Um, you're right also, um, Carlos, that um, the, the inquiry will deal with what we could have done better. In terms of um, what the future looks like, then I think um, we're in this difficult phase where um, people, including the public and politicians, are fed up of the pandemic and are very glad it's over. Um, and I think they're not yet at the stage where um, there can be a full consideration of the fact that actually future pandemics are extremely likely and uh, likely to occur in the professional lifetime of some of the younger scientists in this room, maybe once maybe twice. Um, also, it's been a reminder that pandemics can be really severe, even with a modern range of technologies available to us. We were alone um, without vaccines and without drugs for several months, almost a year without vaccines. And that is always going to be difficult. We are in a change place. Um, some of the new vaccine technologies, uh, platforms can uh, offer the probability that next time we can respond even quicker with um, uh, n vaccines for novel pathogens. And um, much depends upon the amount of corporate learning that is now done by governments and organisations and how that learning is then kept warm lit for the next pandemic. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, the questions uh, here from the audience, there were a couple of hands um, that I could see. Yep. Um, maybe could we give a microphone to, to the lady over here? Her, yep. Uh, hi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, in terms of communication, it seems that you work very hard to try and uh, stop the static noise in, in that diagram you showed to the uh, audience. Um, please don't take my photo. Thank you. <laughs> Um, sometimes that static noise can be deliberate, can't it? For example, giving out terminal illness, 
uh, with a particular, as you said, the way you feel about it, maybe a little bit too interfering from one person to the patient. Do you think that's learned or is that? I'm not quite sure. You might okay, have, so, have another so go. Have another how go. you feel about when you deliver information to yes. a patient to uh, how you should deliver the evidence-based uh, physical ailments or emotional ailments, whatever is going on. You mean when a doctor has bad news, how should they communicate? Absolutely, yes. Right. Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah. uh, can I just finish? The, uh, you've got a module that shows uh, the basis of communication, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it's very basic, that from one human being to the next, when you pass on bad news, it should be, uh, I don't know, uh, with some kind of mannerism. Uh, which maybe, if you want to pass on that bad news, maybe you can uh, minimise that 80% to like 1%, so that that doesn't come across. Okay. So I, th I think I think the kind of communication of difficult circumstances is is, is always a challenge. I think um, empathy is the absolute watchword, and I don't think we've studied empathy in medicine as much as we should have done. Um, I think maybe we've lost some of that. Um, the Stonygate Centre for Empathetic Medicine has just opened at the University of Leicester. Um, it's really going to, in my view, it's, it's a uh, groundbreaking new centre. And I think it's really going to challenge the way in which we um, re-examine how we communicate with our patients and our populations. Okay, it's just your... your so let, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me give a chance to yeah. someone else who, who also wants to... Because we only have time for one, one question. question. It's just in regards to the vaccinations that took a long time to come out. There was a lot of studying involved in putting that together and getting that out to people that were dying. Um, and then if we look at the armed forces and if we look at scientific uh, procedures that are put into place to develop certain chemicals um, which can create pain and, and, and discomfort to people on purpose, intentionally... Uh, why is that science then not kept separate from the National Health Service so the National Health Service can get on with doing their jobs and saving people's lives instead of making them uncomfortable on purpose? I don't really um, understand the thrust of the uh, second question, but on the first one, I think vaccines were enormously fast in being deployed um, to the UK population. I think, the, I, think, I think the Department of Health and Social Care, the NHS, were um, completely ready to move as soon as results were available. Right. So we have one time for one last question. And uh, I think there was a hand back there that came up towards the beginning of the question session. Uh, thank you. How was the communication different when you were either proactively pre-bunking or responding? Sorry, can you speak up a bit? That's, I can't hear. OK. Is it on? Thanks. Can you hear me now? That's better. OK. Uh, how was the comm strategy different when you were either proactively dealing with mis and disinformation or you were responding to it in real time? Yeah, so on, on the kind of disinformation subject, um, my view is that there was plenty of it out there. Um, my view is, has always been, that if you give it airtime, you make it more credible. It shouldn't have airtime because it's not credible. And so my view has never been oh, please, please, please believe my version of events, not this nonsense. My version has, my, my, my response has always been, I'm not prepared to discuss this nonsense because that's what it is. Right. So um, I'm sure there will be many more questions. However, we have to stick to the timetable, but uh, we're not completely done yet. There's one more thing we need to do, and I'll ask Jonathan to come up here. Ah, I should have <laughs> a scroll in here. So we're going to give you a... Ah, this is behind. <laughs> this, is, this is like, uh, like Christmas time. Right. Um, very good. So, this, uh, <laughs> so to finish the evening, then it's a tremendous honor for me on behalf of the Royal Society to uh, give you the actual physical... Uh, uh, David Attenborough 2022 award. Much deserved, and um, we're so grateful for your lecture, and not just for that, for everything you have done 
uh, although this is only a reward for your ability to communicate. Uh, Jonathan, here is Jonathan. So I think uh, we can, we were all already thanked Jonathan, so just all that is left for me is to thank you, the audience, and I'm sure you have been as enthralled as I have, and uh, with Jonathan's really in amazing ability to communicate, not just uh, during the pandemic, but even now, uh, how he communicates about communicating is really amazing. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you all of you for coming here. Mm -hmm.